Well, hello and good afternoon and welcome to the White House and specifically welcome to Open for Questions. This is an online forum that we do from time to time where we bring in uh, various officials from the Obama administration and allow you, the public, to ask questions directly of them. And we are live at whitehouse.gov live. And if you are on that page, just below that uh, player window, there's a little link to Facebook. That's where our chat is going on, and that's where you can type in a question in real time. I'll be here monitoring the questions and the conversation and be uh, posing them to our guests. My name is Jason Jang. I'm the director of video uh, here in the White House New Media Office, and I'm joined by Kieran Ahuja, who is the executive director of the uh, White House Initiative on Asian American and Pacific Islander Communities. And to her right is Gary Locke. He is the Secretary of Commerce. So welcome to you both. And Kieran, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself and this initiative a little bit. Hi, everyone. I'm Executive Director of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, Kieran Ahuja. And I just wanted to wish you a happy Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And we wanted to take this time to wish you well um, as everyone celebrates a lot about our culture, our history, our accomplishments, and then also really acknowledging the challenges that our community still faces um, today. And wanted to take, a t take the time to talk to you a little bit about the initiative. Uh, and we're so happy to actually, and very honored to have Secretary Gary Locke here uh, to share with us um, his thoughts about the initiative. He's the co-chair of the initiative, um, and I think that says a lot about his commitment um, to the Asian American Pacific Islander community. I want to just very quickly, a little bit of Initiative 101 about, uh, about what we do. Uh, the President signed the executive order um, creating the initiative in October 2009. And really it was about uh, increasing access to and f uh, participation in federal programs across the federal government, which was critically important. Uh, one thing we noticed was sort of over a number of years seeing that there really was a lack of knowledge and participation by the community um, in these programs, uh, whether it had to do with uh, linguistic and cultural barriers or general lack of knowledge, um, and really also just countering uh, the model minority myth that says that all Asian Americans are doing well, uh, which we know is not true. There's some pretty staggering statistics out there about uh, the high dropout rates in high schools uh, for Southeast Asians, um, also high poverty rates among Southeast Asians and Pacific Islander communities. Uh, one in five non-elderly non Asian Americans are without health insurance. And what's really astounding is those suffering from chronic hepatitis B, 50% are Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So we have some really major issues that we're dealing with um, in the community. Um, and also really the initiative is about connecting our community to all the amazing reforms out there that this administration is working on to make sure that you know about it, that you're getting the resources and information. Um, so I want to go ahead and turn it over to Secretary Locke. Uh, I just am so overjoyed that you are a part of the initiative, um, along with Secretary Duncan. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a few things about Secretary Locke. Uh, he's the first Asian American governor on the mainland and the first Chinese American Secretary of Commerce. Um, and more than that, really just a fearless leader uh, and uh, a real asset to the community and just a really warm and generous person. So thanks so much for for joining us. Well, thank you very much, yeah. Karen. And, and really, it is a, a great pleasure to serve uh, as a co-chair of the initiative along with Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. Uh, and one thing that I've learned in my years uh, in public service, uh, for, whether the state level uh, or especially here at the federal level, is that there is no GPS system uh, for citizens and small business owners uh, to learn uh, uh, or to take advantage of the myriad of services the federal government offers. Uh, and so that's what uh, this initiative is really all about. And as Kieran indicated, there is a great uh, a myth about uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders as being a model minority, when in fact we have some of the, uh, the most disparaging or, or uh, uh, excuse me, some of the most uh, uh, disparate figures with respect to uh, various subgroups within the AAPI community, whether it's uh, Hmong or Cambodians who have some of the lowest uh, college graduation or bachelor's degree in America, uh, to the fact that uh, uh, AAPIs uh, are, have been most affected by the foreclosure crisis, uh, to also uh, job losses, uh, and some very, uh, very specific uh, uh, medical problems like hepatitis. And so the purpose of the initiative is really to help the AAPI community understand the huge array of programs and services already made available by the federal government 
to, to the entire American population to make sure that these specific subgroups within the AAPI community understand of these services and are able to take advantage of them. Uh, because the Asian American and Pacific Islander community have really long been incredible contributors mm -hmm. to the diversity and the strength and the uh, economic prosperity of this country. Uh, they. Uh, as immigrants, they came here hundreds of years ago. The first wave of immigrants helped build the Transcontinental Railroad. They fought in our world wars to protect the freedom and democracy that we all take for granted. And they've oftentimes been some of those uh, hardest working merchants and entrepreneurs have, that have really built up uh, the industrial and economic might of this country. But it is not uniform throughout the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And it's those subgroups uh, that really need to understand uh, the incredible services and programs that the federal government has as well as what this president has launched uh, and has initiated so that they truly can have their dreams uh, come true and have a better future for themselves and their families. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, I would encourage all of you watching and uh, on the chat to go ahead and add your questions. There have been a lot of great comments and a lot of excitement about this chat. So go ahead and pose your questions. And I'll start with um, a question that we had actually solicited some questions beforehand from some uh, online communities around the country. And thanks to Phil Yu, who uh, reached out to his community and pulled in some questions for us. So let's start with an immigration question. This comes from an Elton. Elton writes, we've been trying to get my cousin to the United States since she was about eight. Now she's over 30. Why does it take so long for people who play by the rules to immigrate to the United States? Well, I think that's why the president is so uh, uh, firmly supportive of immigration reform in this country. Not only do we have a problem of undocumented, some 11 million undocumented uh, of folk here in America already, but we also have uh, 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 problems of enabling family reunification, enabling those who are, who are already here uh, to bring other relatives uh, from all around the world. And we need to understand that we are a land of immigrants. America is a nation of immigrants, except for the Native Americans. All of us are immigrants, whether first generation or tenth generation, whether our parents came here voluntarily or even involuntarily as slaves. And the, the, that strength of America is that diversity of population. And uh, wave after wave of immigrants, whether from Europe, uh, from Asia, Latin America, African continent, have really contributed to that constant renewal of energy and culture and ideas that has really been uh, the bedrock of our economic strength and our diversity of thought. And, and so we need to continue to make sure that we're bringing new people into this country, uh, enabling them to contribute. But the first priority has to be family re reunification. And I know that that's part of the discussion and part of the, the proposals that the Congress has been uh, some, uh, putting forth. Great. Uh, this question may be a little more in the weeds um, than the AAPI, AAPI mm -hmm. initiative, but you both mentioned the high prevalence of hepatitis among that population. Could you speak to why that might be or what some of the numbers might be? You know, I, I actually don't know sort of the specifics of sort of getting into the weeds about um, hepatitis in particular, but uh, in, whether it's re related to being a carrier or being prone to, um, uh, you know, being exposed to hepatitis, uh, it is actually a very prevalent issue and uh, a serious concern. And in fact, um, there's World Hepatitis Day on uh, May 19th, mm -hmm. actually, along with um, API, HIV, HIV and AIDS Awareness Day on May 19th as well. So um, we can definitely get back on that specific question. I don't know, Secretary Locke, if you have some information. I know that definitely is in the weeds a little bit, mm -hmm. and we definitely have staff working on that issue. And I know there's actually a very much of a concerted advocacy effort to build awareness. I also know that within HHS, I think just recently they've convened a group to really think about, um, I think, an expert panel uh, to think about um, how to address this issue because it has such a, uh, a disproportionate impact on the Asian American community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not a medical expert, but I was also startled to learn yeah. uh, of, of the high incidence rates of, of hepatitis among the AAPI community. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Secretary Locke, this might be a question for you. Uh, who would it go? <laughs> uh, are there any specific initiatives in store for Asian American small businesses? Well, actually, we have a whole host of programs at the Department of Commerce aimed at helping small, medium-sized companies grow and expand, uh, especially in the manufacturing sector, to be more lean and, and efficient. Because if uh, the more competitive they are, the, the stronger they'll be, uh, and and 
the better able they will be in order to uh, uh, keep hiring people and keeping people employed. And, and uh, getting people back to work is the president's number one objective. Although we have all these positive signs of economic recovery, consumer confidence up, factory orders up, the total output of the country up substantially from where it was when the president uh, uh, assumed office, nonetheless, we have too many millions of people who are out of work. And as the president said, until every person who wants a job has a job, the recovery is not complete. So we have a whole host of programs aimed at small, medium-sized uh, businesses to help them be much more competitive, especially if they're involved in manufacturing. Uh, it's called, for instance, our MEP program, Manufacturing Extension Partnership, where we'll actually go into a business and help them learn how to cut down their waste, uh, use of water, electricity, uh, how to streamline their operations so that they're more profitable. Because if they're more profitable, the longer they're going to be in business, the more people they're going to hire. We also have an initiative uh, under the president's direction to double the exports of U.S. made goods and services over the next five years to support some two million new jobs in the process. So we have a whole host of services in the Department of Commerce to help companies sell their stuff all around the world. The more they sell, the more they produce. The more they produce, the more workers they're going to need to make that, uh, to make those goods and services. Again, getting people back to work. Great. Uh, Karen, uh, Tim Johnson asks, have you chosen the commissioners? Yes, uh, I get that question quite a bit, and I know it's been a, r a really long process for folks, and I really appreciate uh, all the patience that everyone has had. And just to tell folks a little bit about it, it's uh, uh, been a really conscientious process from our end, uh, and we uh, made it an open process, really reaching out to a number of different groups. A lot of you um, people recommended themselves and others, and we received, you know, more than 2,000 applications, uh, which was quite a bit to go through. But uh, we uh, took a lot of time picking. Uh, uh, making sure that we were thinking about diversity um, mm -hmm. among a number of different um, levels from geography to ethnic background to uh, sector and um, expertise. And so we're hoping uh, that we will have the commissioners on board uh, later this summer. Uh, they are going through the vetting process now, which we know takes some time. So that was 2,000 applications for how many slots? 20. 20, 20 slots, That's, that's yeah. uh, quite a narrowing down process. So yes, it took, yeah. it took quite some time. And we really wanted to uh, really give everyone one sort of uh, um, spend some time and, and look at you know those applications and make sure we're bringing in the right folks. So we're excited about it. So great. Uh, Laura asks this question: In what ways is the administration making a targeted effort to include more AAPI folks in positions of influence? And I would tag along with that a lot of questions about: Are we going to see an uh, AAPI Supreme Court justice? Wow, uh, you, you folks who are actually working closer to the White House would, would know who the president is interviewing. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm really proud of the incredible number of mm -hmm. Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders who are part of this yes, administration. I think it's a record number. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, we ha now have three Asian Americans who are serving uh, on the cabinet. I think mm -hmm. that's the most. Uh, of any administration. Uh, Norman Etta was the first Asian American to serve as a cabinet member uh, in U.S. history, he served as a Commerce Secretary actually for about six months under uh, President Clinton, right. and then President Bush appointed him to be Transportation Secretary. Uh, I, I think this is the most diverse cabinet in U.S. history, and that's a testament to. Uh, the, the values of President Obama. Yeah, and, I, and just to say, I can, you know, we definitely see it in the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So even reaching out um, for our work, we have to connect with so many different agencies and, in, and people in the administration. Um, and then many of them are, you know, from the Asian American Pacific Islander community, um, including Assistant Secretary Tony Babata, who heads up the uh, um, Office of Insular mm -hmm. uh, Areas and in Department of Interior. And many of them have been uh, very supportive. And I think we've just been overwhelmed with the response and people very interested in supporting the initiative. So yeah. I think that's a good sign. Great. Uh, Jenna asks, uh, there, there's a lack of Asian American immigration history. Will that change in America's classrooms? And tied to that have been a lot of questions about just increasing awareness of AAPI cultures. Well, I think that uh, I think there's a general problem with our US, uh, or the textbooks that our American classrooms use in education. Uh, I, I remember. Uh, 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 studying the history books, and it seemed like uh, all the history books stopped after a certain period of time. And, and even some of the more recent uh, events uh, in our history are only, only covered with a paragraph or two or a page or two. Um, and so I think that needs to, be cha needs to change. And so that there, there needs to be community pressure uh, on all, all the major textbooks, uh, 
uh, the publishers of the, of the United States uh, to really have textbooks that really talk about modern history and really uh, deal with it in a way that uh, in a m much more complex and detailed fashion. The second of all, I think that with the power of the internet mm -hmm. uh, and technology, there are ways in which groups can really provide extra materials to the classroom teacher to really talk about whether it's the history of the internment of Japanese during World War II, uh, to the struggles of, of immigrants throughout uh, the last several centuries, uh, to even the contributions and the, and the rich culture and history, let's say, of Native Americans in this country and the specific tribes within a particular mm -hmm. state so that you're not dependent on one nationally published textbook to cover the entire history and culture of all uh, Native American tribes when the state of Washington alone has some 26 different federally recognized mm -hmm. tribes uh, to the issue of, of uh, uh, the Native uh, population, Hawaiian population. Uh, so I, I really think that uh, we should take it upon ourselves uh, to supplement what the Great. publishers are not providing in our in our textbooks. Yeah. And just you know, on a personal note, uh, just sort of t around this idea of like taking responsibility, um, even though it definitely should be a part of uh, our curriculum and sort of uh, promoting multiculturalism, is that I, you know I went to a historically black college, uh, Spelman College. So it was sort of that interest in uh, you know learning about African American history. And I think if we take that time to really learn about other cultures and communities. Um, it just really makes it for uh, you know appreciating sort of all the mm -hmm. contributions. So um, not uh, just expect you know really hoping that most folks, uh, whether you're Asian American, Pacific Islanders, sort of really enjoying this month and and learning a lot about about the community. So. Right. Uh, earlier in the week, we solicited some questions on Facebook, and uh, this is another immigration question. Uh, there, were, th there were just a lot of questions about immigration reform, especially in the wake of uh, Arizona's recent legislation. Uh, how does that type of legislation affect AAPIs, and where do AAPIs fall into the whole conversation about immigration reform? Well, I think that we uh, have to be very concerned about the legislation that passed uh, in Arizona. The president has uh, uh, directed members of his uh, cabinet and especially the Justice Department to take a look at that. I know that uh, many states and, and civil rights groups are also re-examining uh, that uh, Arizona legislation. I, as a former prosecutor, have some questions about just how enforceable that it is. Uh, what constitutes reasonable suspicion that a person may not be here legally? I mean, is there some sp specific activity or actions that a person would engage in that is a red flag that a person is here uh, is here improperly? Um, and and I, I think it, it has uh, it suffers from a lot of vagueness that could really uh, undermine its constitutionality. So there are a lot of questions about that. But more importantly, I think that we need to engage on this issue of immigration and immigration reform. Uh, and, the, and the administration, the president, very much wants immigration reform. Uh, there are proposals uh, that have been submitted uh, by the Senate uh, uh, on immigration reform. And I think some of the, the principles have to focus on uh, securing our borders uh, and, and also making sure that uh, we have clear policies on future immigration. And then th for those who are here uh, illegally, uh, 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 there needs to be a pathway for citizenship that, uh, first of all, uh, uh, requires those uh, to, uh, who want that citizenship uh, to pay any and all back taxes and any penalties, to learn English, uh, and to uh, uh, pass criminal background checks and get in line uh, along with everyone else so that there is no reward for having been here improperly, illegally. You don't get to the front of the line, but you have to stand in line uh, like everyone else and, and, uh, and take the, the various tests in order to uh, obtain citizenship. Uh, as a follow-up to the immigration conversation, uh, is there anything that we as a nation can do to help assimilate AAPI immigrants who are, who are legally here in this country? Um, well, I think that I would probably think about it in a different way. Um, I think that it is a, it's similar to the question that we just got about sort of learning about Asian Americans and sort of a part of the curriculum is that, you know, really just looking at um, all um, uh, immigrants um, who settle here as, as American and, um, and that it really sort of provides such a rich history and um, tapestry for uh, this country. And uh, I do think that there is uh, definitely um, the importance around um, being able to navigate the system. Mm -hmm. Obviously English can be, the, you know, limited um, English proficiency and not knowing English well can be a barrier and, and oftentimes a barrier in our community. I think it's really important. Those are some of the things that we're looking at actually is that when 
uh, around language access and, and that you know, building those English skills are helpful. And sometimes we know that sometimes it's very difficult for our community if you're working two jobs or you're having to take care of a family and you're just thinking about supporting your family, uh, where do you kind of stick in those English classes, right? right? And we can think about a lot of our, especially you were mentioning, I think, in sort of growing up, right? That you- Yeah, my um, mom learned, in, uh, I learned English uh, when I was uh, going to kindergarten right. at the same time that my mom was learning English to become a United States right. citizen. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it definitely sort of should be a part of that. I think that, you know, uh, uh, rather than talking about assimilation, really thinking about how do we sort of make sure that we have um, an inclusive society um, where uh, we appreciate a lot of these different cultures and, um, and we make sure that people have the tools uh, mm -hmm. to really be able to, uh, to, to, to do well. Um, in our in our country in our society, I don't know. What, what, what well, I, I think that uh, uh, we of course want to make sure that as many people as possible learn English because to to succeed here you, you right. need to speak the dominant language. But we also want to make sure that uh, we encourage people uh, to hang on to their native tongues and to, in fact to learn even more languages. Right. Uh, because we as a country are becoming so diverse and uh, you know we have uh, so many businesses encouraging uh, uh, students uh, and young people to learn Mandarin or to learn Spanish or Russian and Japanese. I mean, look at it when, uh, when so many of the visitors and business people coming to our country speak different languages if we want our businesses to, and business people to succeed. Um, they're going to have to have that familiarity with other languages, history, cultures of other countries. Just as uh, for us to succeed when we go abroad, we need to learn the languages and the customs, whether it's of Russia or Italy or France, uh, the Middle East to Latin America. Great. Uh, Rick Duke asks a thoughtful question. Um, well, it appears that the initiative is designed for the mainland AAPI communities. How is this effort expected to impact uh, the Pacific insular jurisdictions such as American Samoa, Guam, and the Northern Marianas? Rick, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it actually is, uh, we are making a very much of a concerted effort to, mm -hmm. to reach out to the Pacific Islander community and to uh, Pacific Islanders, either whether on the mainland um, or they prefer on the continent or um, on the islands, and in a couple of different ways. Um, that was really sort of one of the first things that I was sort of thinking about, how we can mm -hmm. sort of um, ensure that that was going to be a priority, because oftentimes Pacific Islanders have sort of been in the shadows uh, when we talk about the broad or AAPI community. And so uh, we have made sure that there's a strong representation um, on our commission, uh, both of those on the mainland and on the islands. Um, and also, uh, we've been very fortunate um, now to have um, two details from Assistant Secretary Babauta's office mm -hmm. who will focus, and details I mean folks from the federal government who've been placed in our office um, uh, from the islands who are going to specifically focus on Pacific Islander issues um, and uh, really help us sort of think about uh, what our outreach efforts are going to be, we're making a point of meet, meeting with Washington leadership here with the, in the Pacific Islander community, and we have a number of sort of jump-starting our whole efforts uh, in May uh, around uh, uh, roundtable discussions um, in the, uh, with various agencies, and a, a big part of that is including the Pacific Islander community and making sure that people understand the issues uh, that are impacting the community. So that's sort of uh, a little bit about what we're doing, and, um, uh, and I, we know that also there's a lot of resources coming into the Pacific Islander community from the Recovery Act. Mm -hmm. um, and um, also from education reform. And so we just want to make sure that, uh, um, especially uh, not only sort of with the islands, but even uh, the Pacific Islanders on the mainland, that we're really addressing some of those issues. Sure. I thought you were going to say something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, Tejinder just uh, asked this question um, as a follow up, perhaps. Uh, do you include Indians and Southeast, a Southeast Asians in this? Yes, <laughs> very much so. I think it's the whole breadth of, of the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And I don't know if you came on right in the beginning, but we were talking a lot about uh, really looking at specific subgroups um, within the Asian American community and how it's so actually really important to break that out right. around disaggregation of data. I think oftentimes uh, it gets a little skewed about what, how um, sp distinct communities are impacted. Right, um, the, the different health outcomes yeah. among different uh, subgroups within the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Uh, there are some subgroups that have high educational attainment and yet other groups with very, very low, right. below the national average. To the earlier we were talking about the, the higher incidence of hepatitis among subgroups as well. So uh, a whole host of issues. Great. Uh, 
Uh, Joy asked this question, how about supporting AAPI artists and art movements? Uh, will this be part of the initiative? Well, art, uh, I mean, we have, uh, in, if you look at the executive order, and uh, uh, it actually specifically lists arts, um, among other things like the environment and commerce and business and um, education and labor. So uh, I think that'll be reflected in our commissioners. Uh, and, um, and also, we're working very closely with uh, Cal Penn, and he heads up um, um, arts, among other things, youth and the Asian American Pacific Islander community. So, um, that's a really good question, I have to say, to be quite honest with you. We have been focusing a lot on uh, some of the issues and disparities, um, but it's a good point and something we'll definitely keep in mind. But it's something that we can, during, for instance, AAPI Month, uh uh, celebrate. We have incredible diversity of people, mm -hmm. but also accomplishments, and especially in the in the artistic yeah. field. And uh, that's something that we should celebrate. I can tell you that, uh, for instance, uh, we have an art gallery in the reception room yeah. of the Department of Commerce. I thought you were going to tell me you play an instrument. No, no, no. no <laughs> but but uh, it's featuring artists from the Pacific Northwest, and and I think 80 percent of those artists are Asian Americans, Pacific right. Islanders. Okay. Uh, Mary asks, how will this, um, how will you work with other federal agencies to integrate approaches for AAPI? Is the scope of this initiative um, interagency? Sure. So uh, the way it's set up is that there's a 20-person commission, which is really our connection to the community, and then there's an, what we call an interagency working group. And we're tasked to work with more than 23 federal agencies and offices uh, to really coordinate uh, the work that they do. And a part of that, and it's very specific in the executive order, if you want to go on our website at www.aapi.gov uh, to read that executive order, which is riveting, but really it's, uh, <laughs> it's um, it really is important. Important and um, so, uh, but seriously, uh, it's uh, um, uh, what we ask specifically of the agencies uh, is that they have to come up with a specific agency plan um, that sets out, you know, identifying the programs that um, that uh, impact the API community, determining whether um, they really are reaching the community, what are the resources need to be allocated, how if they're good ones, can we replicate them? Um, if we need to tailor mm -hmm. specific programs to the community, we need to do that and to set out sort of high priority action items, uh, talk about how they're going to involve the community, um, as well as look at sort of federal employment numbers. There's a host of things uh, that are going to be um, asked of the agencies um, in this interagency working group. And what's great is that Secretary Locke, you're heading that initiative along right. with Secretary Duncan, which I said, you know, I think makes a really strong statement about how this is a priority for this administration. Well, th this is very much a priority for the administration. And it's, uh, this initiative has been completely revamped uh, from the initiative and as it was implemented under President Bush. And of course, the initiative was really started under President Clinton. Clinton. Uh, but you know, the, the point is that we have a whole host of and a huge array of federal services available to the entire population of America. Uh, and because of the disparate numbers uh, in terms of whether it's educational outcomes for some subgroups to health outcomes, uh, disparities in uh, health uh, conditions among AAPI, uh, we need to make sure that the AAPI community is fully aware of these services and that the agencies also be more aggressive uh, in targeting those who are suffering most. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really simply want to make uh, this partnership between the federal government and the AAPI community much more effective so that the AAPI community is getting its fair share of federal resources to tackle some of the very issues that are uh, confronting the AAPI community. Great. Uh, Mike asks a great wrap-up question. Uh, how will you keep this initiative an ongoing engagement so it's not just a one-time event? And how can they stay in touch? Is there a subscription, a mailing list, or some mm -hmm. way for them to uh, keep abreast question. of uh, this initiative? Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, uh, well, first of all, I think uh, one thing that we're looking at is that we really want the initiative. Uh, it's sort of had different homes sort of throughout its history, first in the, you know, coming, uh, starting at, at the Health and Human Services, and then being at Commerce, um, and now in education. And I think that a part of what we're trying to do is really make this a mainstay as far as, you know, that we have a home for a while and sort of really set up shop and, and um, sort of get started with the work that we want to do. Um, but at the end of it, I've always talked about, you know, one day wanting the initiative to be obsolete. That you know, we really sort of move, become sort of part of the fabric of the government, sort of in every agency. That there's an understanding. We've built the sort of knowledge of the community within the agencies. That we've looked at those programs, and that when people sit down at the table, um, that that 
that uh, there hasn't, doesn't always have to be a prompting of, you know, what about the Asian American Pacific Islander community, or they don't quite understand because of the model mi minority myth issue. Um, so I think that's sort of my hope eventually, is that, um, that it is something that is around for a while, but I sort of look sort of more long term. Um, and I think a part of that is continuing to have your support, Secretary Well, and, and your and, leadership, and your right? leadership, but also the, the 20 members of, right. of the commission or part of the initiative who will really be the interface between the federal government and the communities. And these 20 members need to impress upon all of us and the federal government of the needs, concerns, the priorities mm -hmm. of the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And hopefully, uh, not only uh, over time will the federal agencies be right. always cognizant uh, of the presence, the issues, uh, the problems of the uh, Asian American Pacific Islander community, but also the AAPI community understands and knows of the resources available within the federal government and even their local governments. Mm -hmm. So there is not that need uh, for this special relationship. And, and I think just to continue to encourage that, you know, it really is about this partnership with government. And so for the community to continue reaching out to us, and a part of doing that, as I mentioned, our website, which is at www.aapi.gov. Um, and then also you can email us directly at White House aapi at ed.gov. That's White House, aapi at ed.gov. Um, we're going to be having conference calls, webinars, and also we are going to be launching our national community engagement tour. Oh, so good. hope you'll join us for part of that. Yeah. But um, And so that'll be another way to, um, you know, for us to be out in the community and hearing from folks. So yeah, we're looking forward to it. Really exciting. Really yeah, exciting. Yeah, I know. Definitely. Yeah, well, thanks for all your questions, and the conversation was great online. I hope you enjoyed this time. Uh, Secretary Locke, uh, Karen Ahuja, thank you for your time. If you tuned in late, uh, this video will be posted at whitehouse.gov slash video probably in three hours or so. So that's all we've got for you. Thanks for, uh, for watching.